In part one, I, I introduced you to what fire assay was and how it could benefit the small scale miner or prospector. I briefly mentioned that equipment was a contributing factor in regards to startup costs. In this presentation, I would like to go deeper into the equipment and the materials that you will need to conduct a successful fusion, cupellation, and subsequent refinement. Hi, I'm Rob Boyko, Boyko Mineral Exploration, and welcome back. To start with, you will need a pot furnace, which is commonly referred to as a fusion furnace. In some cases, you could get by just using a muffle furnace, but for assays that require higher temperatures, a crucible furnace is needed. The muffle furnaces are used for roasting and copulation. The crucibles are used in conjunction with the fusion furnace for the creation of your lead beads. The scorifiers are used for the same purpose, but are more for special requirements. The capels are used to further refine your beads. These are used to eliminate the lead, resulting in a precious metal bead known as the door bead, or prill. Roasting dishes are used to eliminate the sulfur component in your concentrates or ore materials, and that includes organic materials as well. And the parting cups are used to eliminate the silver content of your prill, thus producing a more finer gold bead. A simple glass jar or beaker can be used for this purpose. However, it must be heat resistant to breakage and cracking. For annealing, the scorifiers are commonly used. In order to handle the crucibles, capels, etc., additional tools are required. Charging tongs are used for the handling of larger crucibles where the use of a large fusion furnace is used, or when removing larger crucibles from a pot fusion furnace. Crucible scorification tongs are commonly used around muffle furnaces due to the smaller melting pot sizes. Capel tongs are designed to handle the different capels. As the name suggests, button tongs are basically specially designed tweezers for the safe handling of the lead buttons. Tweezers, which are not shown, are used to handle the refined beads. Scrapers are simply used to remove any boiled over metal or spillage inside of a furnace. Scrapers are also used in the process of refining bullion. The anvil is used to square the lead buttons into cubes for compilation. No need to explain the hammer. Once you have some of the equipment already mentioned, you will need some consumables in the form of chemical reagents. These are not recoverable for the purpose of reusing. These chemicals are actually used for the formation of the slag and the lead buttons, as well as refinement and purification of your prills. On the left side of the are the chemicals that are most commonly used. The silicon dioxide is pure powdered quartz. However, powdered glass can also be used as glass is a form of quartz. The disodium tetraborate is commonly known as borax glass or just simply borax, and the sodium carbonate is referred to as soda ash or washing soda by the old timers. The purer the grades, the better. In the industry, lead oxide is litharge and the potassium nitrate has the common name of nitre. Flour is just that, plain organic flour used for baking. The lead is just lead beads and also foil, which is used for importation and scorification. These lead beads or lead should be silver free. Sodium chloride is just plain old table salt. The acids commonly used is nitric acid and hydrochloric acid. Hydrochloric acid is often referred to as muriatic acid. Both of these acids are used to make aqua regia. Less common is the dipotassium tartrate. The common name for this chemical is plainly argol, A-R-G-O-L, while the potassium hydrogen tartrate is just plainly called by the old timers cream of tartar. Powdered charcoal is usually replaced with the flour, but under certain conditions, the charcoal is still required. Instead of powdered iron, iron nails and iron bars, or even pipes are sometimes substituted. Lead tetra 
tetroxide is called red lead by the old timers and calcium oxide is just plainly powdered limestone or simply lime. The common name for calcium fluoride is fluorospar and the sodium hexafluoraluminate is cryolite. The powdered sulfur is used in the nickel sulfide fusion methods along with the nickel oxide or powdered nickel. The acids that are still used for special application is the sulfuric formic and acidic acids. All will be explained in greater detail in an upcoming presentation. Personal safety cannot be underemphasized. It must always be number one on the priority list. Face shields come in many styles and shapes. However, they undoubtedly need to be fire resistant and pervious to flying objects, especially splattering molten material. Gloves need to be heat resistant and protective against those splatters and spills. Some come with gauntlets and others without it. It is personal choice. However, if they come without gauntlets, then aluminum sleeves should or must be worn for protection. Aluminum protective aprons should also be used when handling hot molten material. Some varieties are made with sleeves attached. If an aluminum apron is not available, then a good leather blacksmith or welder's apron could be a substitute. When working with concentrates and samples during the fusion and coupling stages, toxic gases are relieved, such as sulfur dioxide. Breathing masks with the appropriate canisters need to be used. Lead vapors are also a big concern as lead is toxic during repeated exposure. During parting, toxic vapors are also present, and this process needs to be carried out on a fume hood or within a fume hood that is. If a fume hood is not available, then it may be done outdoors or in a well ventilated area while using your respirator, that is your breathing mask with the right canisters attached. When we talk about pot furnaces, there are three types. The newest of these are electric and oil or gas fired. In the old days, when neither of these fuel sources were used, these furnaces were coke fired, similar to that of a blacksmith's forge. These furnaces were once called wind furnaces, but these days we refer to them as pot furnaces or fusion furnaces. Unlike the picture on the left, the pot furnaces were sometimes placed alongside of a muffle furnace. Each had their own ash pits and the coke was charged, that is placed into the furnace from the top. At the bottom was usually a draft hole or some form of forced draft. The average pot furnace had a crucible cavity that was roughly 12 to 15 inches square with a depth to the coke bars of about 24 inches. These furnaces are no longer used today, except in rare instances, without any forced draft temperatures, about 1000 degrees centigrade could be reached. But with a forced draft, 1400 degrees centigrade was reached. These furnaces were generally made of refractory bricks, which were made to withstand such high temperatures. The coke-fired furnaces had an inherent problem, such as the probability of sample or bullion contamination. Because these were coke-fired, ash was the problem. Other problems were in the temperature control of the furnace. They were not that accurate, to say the least. The ash pits had to be cleaned constantly, and coke had to be produced for these furnaces, which was labor-intensive. As time went on, oil, usually in the form of kerosene, became more available. Furnaces were either converted to burn these fuels and new furnace designs incorporated efficient burner components. These two had their problems with soot. These days, propane and natural gas fired furnaces are used where electricity is not available or the cost of electricity is too expensive to operate electric furnaces. These newer designs are much 
more cleaner, more efficient, and have excellent temperature control. Set the desired temperature and away you go. Some are top loaded and some are side loaded. Temperatures range from 1000 degrees centigrade to 1800 degrees centigrade, like the high temperature laboratory furnace HTF, which has a maximum temperature of 17 to 1800 degrees centigrade. This furnace has a chamber volume of 4 to 10 liters. One other note, fusion furnaces are considered as closed system furnaces. The crucible is completely engulfed in the combusting gases which exits into the chimney. Unlike the muffle furnace, there is no access to the clean, cool outside air. Muffle furnaces at a glance resemble fusion furnaces. However, these furnaces are considered to be open systems. That is, they have a closed vessel chamber that is sealed from the combusting gases of the coke, oil, or gas-fired systems. The vessel chamber also has an air inlet and an exhaust outlet separate from the exhaust chimney. This air inlet is controlled by some form of valve system. The new gas systems and the electrical systems are electrically controlled which allows for accurate temperature and airflow control. The coke and oil fired units are no longer used. Gas is commonly used and so are the electrical units. These units are front loaded and the vessel chamber is anywhere from 8 to 15 inches deep. However, the large laboratory versions may be quite larger. These will have front loading doors that either swing sideways, swing downwards like an oven door, or swing upwards. More on the purpose of the ventilation of these units will be discussed in a future presentation on cupellation. Electricity is much cleaner and therefore preferred for the home laboratory or the commercial lab. Gas-fired furnaces are equipped with electronic control units, but some portable units will not have this feature, and therefore temperature and airflow will not be accurately controlled. It is always recommended these days to purchase one that is electrically controlled. This may become a problem regarding portable units. An inverter generator of a suitable size will be required for the field. Regular generators deliver dirty power, which can or may destroy the sensitive electronics used to control the furnace temperature, etc. Unlike the electric units, in these furnaces, as the temperature increases, carbon is released as an elemental carbon. This is most prevalent in the oil-fired units in the form of smoke or soot not so much with propane or natural gas. In a fusion furnace, as the temperature increases, carbon monoxide is produced in the form of a gas which produces a toxic atmosphere. However, as the temperature is further increased, carbon dioxide is produced. This creates an environment which is more reducing. The collection of the precious metals in the lead button become affected. Temperature must not be allowed to rise where it becomes too excessive. Once these gas-fired furnaces reach the required temperatures, the fuel supply should be cut back to avoid excessive temperature. Furnaces come in many designs and sizes. They can range from a couple hundred dollars to thousands of dollars. As a small prospector or miner, cost is a contributing factor when considering the purchase of a furnace. For the more serious, I would recommend the starter kits, which are roughly $7,500 US, like the ones shown from 911 metallurgists. The smaller unit shown uh, is roughly $490, which is similar to what I use in the field. It serves both as a fusion as well as a muffle furnace. However, it took quite a bit of experimentation to get decent results. Due to cost, one may consider making your own. There are a lot of designs out there, 
It's all about choice. Crucibles come in many sizes and shapes. They are made from many different refractory materials. Most common are the fire clay, the graphite, and ceramics. It is the fire clay crucibles that are mostly used. These are made from a mixture of raw fire clay and sand. Some of the raw clay is sometimes burnt, which is then combined with the raw clay. This mixture is then ground to a suitable particle size. It's mixed with water and kneaded in a pug mill until it becomes a dough. This dough, like putty, is called pug. This pug material is then molded in a molding machine to a determined shape and then slowly dried in drying shed using heated air and sometimes gas. At the end of the drying process, they are baked in ovens at temperatures of 1400 degrees centigrade or higher. Crucibles have to be tough in order to withstand the harsh environments that they are placed in. They have to be tough enough to withstand those high temperatures without softening or even breaking down due to melting. When they are boxed and shipped to a store or customer, they are subjected to some harsh handling by the shipping companies. They have to be strong enough to survive the trip. In furnaces, the doors are open and closed, which will cause the temperatures to fluctuate considerably. Crucibles must be able to withstand or resist these sudden temperature changes. During the fusion process, chemical reactions take place, some of which are corrosive and will eventually eat away at the crucible to the point where the crucible will have holes eaten through them, which results in failure and loss. They have to be somewhat impervious to the corrosive reactions. Combustion gases may also be erosive, resulting in the deterioration of the crucible, and therefore must be resistant to the erosive environment. Crucibles can be expensive. When you receive them, they must be checked carefully. A defective crucible can also be a safety hazard. There is the usual physical check, such as checking for cracks, chips, breakage, etc. However, their dimensions and capacity should also be checked. Any deformity usually indicates defectiveness. Any defective crucible should not be used and discarded. One should also know what the life expectancy of a crucible should be. If you are purchasing a case of crucibles, then one crucible should be selected at random and tested. The test is simple. Add a fair amount of litharge into a selected crucible. Heat to temperature and record the length of time it takes the lead oxide to eat through the crucible. The time it takes to eat a hole through the crucible can be used to calculate the life expectancy of the crucible. 80% is usually taken to be the safe working life of the crucible. Any time after that time limit, a crucible may fail unexpectedly. Scorifiers are small fire clay crucibles. The difference is, is in their size and their shape. They are small, usually circular, and shallow. However, they may also be square. They are thick-walled, smooth on the inside. As with crucibles, they too must be impervious to molten lead and slag. They are made to resist the corrosion from the reaction of the molten litharge, as they are made with a minimum amount of uncombined silica. They come in different sizes, which is determined by their diameter. They range in size from two and a half inches to four and a half inches in diameter. Their use will be discussed in a future presentation on scorification.
Roasting dishes come as either circular dishes, similar to a scorifier, or they may be square or rectangular in shape. Most are made of lower grade fire clay, and some are made with fused silica as well as other materials. Unlike scorifiers, these have thinner walls and are not made for fusion or cubulation. Roasting does not require high temperatures, and therefore would not be subjected to higher temperatures. Roasting will be covered in a little more detail in a future presentation within this series. They range in cost from as little as $2 each up to $90 each for the large square fused silica dishes. Like the scorifiers, they are sized by their diameter. These small cylindrical vessels are made porous, capable of absorbing lead oxide and other wastes. They are used in a process called cupellation, which will be further discussed in a future presentation. These cupellation pots are used in the first of two stages of refinement of the noble and precious metals. Capels are not fusion crucibles. One has to remember that fire assay is not only an analytical tool. For small scale miners, it is also a refining tool as you will learn later. These come in different sizes. Some are sized by a letter and a number arrangements such as A6 to A13, or by absorption ratings as shown. Cost will range from 22 cents up to $2.50 each. All depends on capel type and quantity, as these are usually sold as case lots. These two come in many different sizes and are sized by volume capacity. Most are made of ceramic material, which is impervious to acids. Cost also differs between suppliers and some, like the quartz thimbles and tray, are used for both parting and annealing. The ceramic cups can also be used for annealing. For the ceramic cups, trays are available. The ceramic cups are quite common and easily obtained. Usually one has to contact the supplier for pricing. The quartz unit shown is not that common and some prefer this style. It can be purchased from a company called Fire Assay out of Barcelona, Spain. For the small miner and or prospector, using parting cups for only refining, a Pyrex beaker is all that is needed. You can place all your beads into a single beaker of suitable size for parting. However, if you are using Fire Assay for analytical purposes, then you will need to weigh and part each of your beads separately to obtain accurate results. Well, this concludes part two of the series of the Art of Fire. Being focused on the equipment and tools required, I hope that you have a good insight as to what will be required to conduct a successful pre-concentration collection and refinement of your noble and precious metals. This is fire assay. In the next presentation I will be leading up to the reagents or fluxes you will need to complete a successful assay. However, before I can even talk about these reagents, I need to have a discussion on some basic chemistry. Yes, chemistry is involved. I did mention in part one that most of those that post video and the like do not really explain how you can be successful in conducting an assay for the collection and refinement of your gold from concentrates that are too small in particle size to just capture with a sluice box or even a pan. I will be explaining as we go through these presentations and you will soon realize that the science is easy to use and why it works. I want to say thanks for watching as I try to promote mining and prospecting as a small business, but more so as a hobby, this channel does not try to sell you anything. It is for education only, and if it helps you out, the best tip you can give me is feedback, give me a like, and a share. I'm Rob Boyko, along with my daughter this time, Boyko Mineral Exploration.